I, uh, I now call on Nandor Tanchos to make a valedictory statement. Nandor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I give thanks and praise unto the Most High Jah Rastafari. I give greetings to all in the name of the Holy Trinity, the Almighty Father, the Divine Mother, the Child that is love made life. I greet the members of this house for the last time as one of you. I greet those in the gallery and I thank you for honouring me by your presence, and especially my beloved Ngahuya Murphy. And my greetings to my anu and my apu, my friends, family, allies and supporters watching from Africa, from Europe, from Asia, from the Americas, from Australia. So I guide to you all. Madam Speaker, I was elected to this parliament in 1999 and my life changed. I knew it would. Unlike most members of the public, I had a pretty good idea what being an MP was like. It was one of the reasons I hesitated to stand. It's life, Jim, but not as we know it. It's an intense 24-7 job. We digest enormous amounts of information, sometimes boring, and then we have to make decisions. Decisions that affect real people. It means being constantly available to the media, to the public, and to the party. It means scrutiny of every detail of our lives particularly for a dreadlocked Rastafarian. I stood, I guess, to demonstrate that you don't have to be of this world to be effective in it. Be true to oneself, whoever one may be, and take your seat as an equal, whether it's here in the House of, Part of Representatives or in the dust of the streets. So when a kid grabbed my arm on the dance floor and said, hey bro, what's up in Parliament? I considered it an honour because my purpose here has been to represent those who have had no voice here, those held in contempt by too many of us. I came to Parliament thinking you're all a bunch of bastards, <laughs> and I was wrong. There are many good people here. The very notion that all politicians are dishonest is misconceived, because if we think that politicians are all venal, then we expect nothing from them but venality. We should raise our expectations. We should expect more from question time than a bun fight. I've avoided question time for years if I don't have to be here because I've got a sup. Because question time is the time I'm most ashamed of being a member of parliament. Question time and general debate. And you all know what I'm talking about. We should grow up. This is our national legislature. We should treat it and the positions we hold here with more respect. But I don't just blame MPs. The buzzards who sit watching us from up there, <laughs> waiting for the next political corpse to pick over, are also to blame. Because they'll always report a fight which is why the pugnacious Mr Peters always gets a headline. But stand to talk about anything real, and most of them flap their wings and fly away. Most of them. And I thank you for being here too. Maybe corporate media ownership is to blame for the lack of analysis prevalent in the New Zealand media. Or maybe it's just contempt for the audience. One thing I'm proud of is the independent prison ombudsman. Most people don't care much what happens to people in prison, to the point that four police were yesterday acquitted after repeatedly battening and pepper spraying a man in police cells. What's next? Are they going to get away with murder? Oh, I forgot, they already did in Waitara. But I care, because I know that any of us here could have been there but for the grace of God. The media will, will report a death in custody, but not an institution that will prevent them. The day of the announcement was the day that Trevor Mallard demonstrated his pugilistic skills with Toe Henry out in the lobby over there. No prizes for guessing what got covered and what did not. So to the media gallery, my love to you all. But I would ask that you scrutinise yourselves at night 
as fiercely as you scrutinise us during the day. Some people say that Guy Fawkes was the only politician to enter Parliament with honest intentions. <laughs> I don't think that's true. Many, perhaps most MPs enter with honest intentions, but we are compromised by this institution. How many times have Green MPs spoken in this House to have other MPs sidle over and tell us quietly, we agree with you? But they are silenced by their hopes for advancement, for promotion, or sometimes just to stay where they are. My mum used to say, you have to get into the system to change it. And it's true that we need good people working within, but the danger is the system changed us as much as we change the system, if not more. And that's why I'm leaving. After nine years, and for those members of the public who judge the behaviour of others by their own standard, no, there are no perks coming to me. After nine years, it's time to cleanse my soul. So to all members of this House, from the most senior to the newest entrants, I pray for you that you remember the light that shines within us so you can light a path for yourselves and for others. Because the problem is not how many people enter this place with honest intentions, but how many people leave with them intact. It's easy to slip. We become bloated by self-importance. People open doors for us, they clean our offices at night, they provide us with advice and support, and they wait on our decisions. And many thanks to all the people who do that, the friendly security, the select committee staff, advisers and cleaners. And my thanks to the fantastic Green Party staff who are up there, who are so critical to the work we do as MPs. You guys rock! <laughs> but my thanks also to those outside this place who research and campaign, because Parliament relies on the free work done by NGOs and ordinary people coming to select committees and raising awareness in the public about issues of importance. So take climate change. It was years of campaigning and advocacy and accumulating evidence outside of Parliament before any party except the Greens took this seriously enough to take a position, if not take serious action. Unfortunately, despite evidence that urgent and drastic mitigation is needed right now to avoid catastrophic climate change, this country still has a lackadaisical mitigation strategy. There's growing concern that oil production is reaching its peak at the same time as demand is increasing, both from increased consumption in the West and economic expansion in Asia, and the government's strategy is to build more roads. Now, I'm not sure if that's the climate change strategy or the peak oil strategy. Perhaps it's both. And don't laugh, National, because I haven't seen your policy yet. I haven't even begun to talk about metals depletion or the food insecurity and political instability that will result from climate change and peak oil. Or about the sustained economic recession that will result as the global economy crashes into the ecological limits of our planet. And if you think that the life we're living in privileged countries like Aotearoa New Zealand is sustainable in any way, you are seriously deluded. In my view, Industrial civilization is coming to an end. I believe we are in the last days of the oil age. We need to transition strategy away from a growth economy to a steady state economy. But it will not come from government because governments are almost universally compromised by the corporate agenda of globalised trade, globalised capital transfers and globalised investment. And it doesn't matter whether it's the left hand or the right hand, it's the same brain that controls. Where it will come from, where it's already coming from, is ordinary people working in their communities. From doing transition towns, permaculture design, better transport campaigns, community sustainability plans. And I pay tribute to those far-sighted ones who are showing us the way. Because as the saying goes, when the people lead, the leaders will follow. We need to make a major redesign if we want to build resilient systems that provide genuine food security, genuine energy security, and allow us to live rich, abundant, and meaningful lives in a sustainable way. To do that, I believe we need a technological reform so that the protection of, of the integrity of ecosystems is a primary design element rather than a clip-on. 
We need economic reform to build a steady state economy. In particular, I believe we need land reform, where security of tenure is based on use rights rather than paper ownership, and to free up land for smallholders. Because growing evidence suggests that the most productive farming systems are small-scale, diverse cropping organic systems. They're not the most profitable under our current distorted economic framework, but they are the most productive. And they will become even more important as the cost of running farm machinery and producing synthetic fertilisers and pesticides grows. And lastly, we need constitutional reform. We have a bizarre notion in this country that the Queen is the source of justice and power. I say, fire burn that rascal up. I hope to see the day that New Zealand becomes a republic, decentralises political power and recognises the rights of tangata whenua to their tino rangatira tanga. People get confused by that. The version of the treaty signed by Governor Hobson, signed by 512 of the 559 or so chiefs that signed, the version recognised in international law under the doctrine of contra preferendum was the Māori language version that did not cede sovereignty to the Crown but it did affirm the tinoranga teratanga of hapu. And we Pākehā people make a mistake, in my opinion, if we say we don't want that for Māori people. We should say, of course we support that. And what's more, we want some for ourselves. Because I don't believe that this parliamentary system works very well for anyone except MPs and corporate lobbyists. Madam Speaker, one of the first things I did on entering Parliament was buy a watch. And since then, I have been shackled to the system. <laughs> I've been cuffed to the prison bars of time, or at least the prison that we make of time. This arbitrary Roman calendar disconnects us from the natural rhythms of life and of the planet. And so today, I remove that shackle. <laughs> because when I look at the state of our rivers, our atmosphere and our people, I don't need a watch to tell me what time it is. Order, the House will continue with its normal business.